Would you consider that as a scientist? Is it a miracle that Jesus came back from the dead? And you want to fix it so bad when your child's hurt. And you just have to remember that he's watching over her. In what ways have the teachings of the Book of Mormon influenced your knowledge of and love for the Savior Jesus Christ? Through him, I can overcome all my mistakes, my sins, and even death. Reading about Jesus Christ every single day was what kept me going. Science felt was pitching me against the church, but now I've merged them in the most satisfying and powerful way. Approaching dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and a few others went to the sepulcher where Jesus' body lay. They, of course, found the stone had been rolled away, and inside the tomb, uh, Jesus' body gone. An angel appeared and declared unto them, perhaps some of the most comforting words in history, he's not here, but is risen. At which point she knew that death had been swallowed up by the victory of Christ. It's not easy losing a loved one, obviously. We, we mourn for them, we grieve their loss. But I'll tell you, without those comforting angelic words, he is not here but is risen, I mean, we'd be completely inconsolable. And, and the loss of our loved ones would truly be an eternal tragedy. The fact is, Jesus Christ died and was resurrected that all of us might one day live again with our loved ones. When we're going through those not seeing is not believing moments or we wonder if God is really there, I found that I can find comfort in the pages of the Book of Mormon. I can pretty much open it anywhere and somewhere in there, I'm going to find a witness of Jesus Christ and that's what brings me hope and that's what fills me with faith. I'm Scott Christopher and in this special Easter episode of A Marvelous Work, we're not going to be searching for evidence of the Book of Mormon itself, but we're going to be using the Book of Mormon to serve as evidence for the reality of Jesus Christ. We'll talk to people from different walks of life. We'll talk about all things denoting that there is a God and how the Book of Mormon supports Christ's mission, how it testifies of his role as savior and redeemer and giver of life to those who believe. My name is Amanda McPeak. I was born and raised in Guatemala. And growing up, I didn't know who I was. When I was 18 years old, the missionaries came to my house and they taught me about the Book of Mormon. In the Book of Mormon, I learned that God was aware of all of his children, regardless of color. And the Book of Mormon says, whether they are bond or free, black and white, he didn't care about how we look like. We are his children. The Book of Mormon taught me that I was a daughter of God, that he loved me. And I'm very grateful because he gave me hope and his atonement brought me the knowledge that I can change, that I can have a second chance because I am a daughter of God. He knows me. From childhood, David Allred had a keen interest in science. Now with a PhD in physics and physical chemistry from Princeton, Dr. Allred explores the mysteries of science from quantum physics to the chemistry of life. Yet nothing is more compelling to him than his witness of Christ. Uh, the, the, there's, there's universal truths literally throughout the universe that hold true Yeah, that's in what we, terms of physics. That's what we keep wondering, and so far that seemed to be the case. But physicists are always checking that out. What scientists are doing and what people of faith are doing are the same thing. They're hoping to understand the basic truths of the universe. Now, speaking specifically of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, is that a miracle? 
are, are there, is there any way scientifically to explain what may have occurred? Or is, I mean, do we just have to truly take that at face value and believe that as the Spirit indicates to us that this really happened, this man came back to life, and because of that, we will also come back to life. Is there any scientific evidence that that could occur anywhere in the universe, scientifically? So the point is, is when we look at what goes into making a human being, we realize as time goes on, you know, that we do more and more of bringing people back to life. He did have a physical body. Yeah. And then that physical body was resurrected. So it had in his cells all the information to produce that physical body. So I'm guessing that the Lord, who is not just um, our Savior, but he was the creator of the universe. Yeah. And the elements obey him. Yes. Do, do you know in your heart and mind that Jesus Christ Oh, yes. Is I have a firm testimony of that. Uh, the Spirit has testified to me many times. You have told us from your experience how faith and science can and should absolutely work hand in yes. hand in understanding our faith in Jesus Christ, his atonement, what he does for us, the relationship we have with our Savior, as well as mortals, yeah. has just been beautiful. Thank you so Good. much. I'm glad, Scott, because um, I remember Sister Condi's remarks in conference a year ago. In fact, my cell phone, every time I opened it up and pushed on the gospel library, went to that talk. And you remember what her father told her? Never give up an opportunity to testify of Jesus. That's much stronger than always testify of our Lord. Yeah. It's never give up an opportunity. Yeah. And you gave me an opportunity well, to testify of Jesus Christ. Yeah, you Thank look, you. We can write down the barrel of that camera there. And you gave a beautiful testimony yes. of Jesus Christ. Thank now, you. Um, that we're done, I want you to explain some other things in this building, okay. a lot of tubes and wires. And... Yeah, I think we told them. Is it, is it, is it... You never said, but we love dinosaurs. Um, hi, I am Adrian Lyman. And I have recently returned home from serving um, a mission. And on my mission, I had some very unique challenges dealing with anxiety and OCD and even developed some habits of eating disorder. And it was really hard. But in this experience, I have learned to rely on my Savior, Jesus Christ. And through reading the Book of Mormon and hearing the stories of how he wants to intervene and he is so mindful of them. Help me to realize that he was mindful of me in my situation and that he was going to be there for me and that through his grace and his sacrifice, I can be healed and that there is peace possible. And I just know that that is true. And I also know that the Savior and Heavenly Father love us so much individually, despite all of our challenges and all of our flaws. Communications professor Scott Church penned the words, and music professor Brent Jorgensen scored the music. Their new hymn, All Things Denote There Is a God, testifies with the Book of Mormon that Jesus is the Christ. Have your testimonies, I'll ask each of you, been enhanced or deepened or even born because of certain church hymns or music? With me, one reason why hymns are so powerful, why they evoke the Spirit so strongly is music works like the Spirit in my experience, where music and the Spirit are both ineffable. They're both greater than, than words. They can touch you in ways, in more deeper, profound ways than, than language alone can. Great point. I'll tell you, Redeemer of Israel, the, the, the words combined with the music, both together, changed my life. One of my ways of thinking about 
hymns is like a shortcut to filling the spirit. Yes. Uh, it, it brings you there quickly, especially when you have those those experiences, those formative experiences of gaining a testimony and 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 and, and you associate that with the hymn, it brings you back to that and it helps you remember when you when you hear these hymns. The scriptures clearly testify. What does this this hymn all things denote there is a God. What does it mean to you? Why are you, why have you written this? Why has this hymn come together? There's a, a couple of reasons why uh, I wrote this, uh, these words. And in one, because it's such a powerful testimony in the Book of Mormon. It's among some of my favorite testifying that happens in, in all of Holy Scriptures when Alma bears his testimony to Korihor and he uses these words. And so, it's an important moment in the scriptures, but there's also a beautiful poetry to it. Um, the, the phrase, all things denote there is a God, there's a beautiful poetry there. It's actually called tetrameter, there's a meter to it. Yeah, this one is so perfect because it fits perfectly with the hymn text. The 8888 kind of uh, rhymed, yeah. So was it easy for you to put the music to it? Well, because he wrote it, and it, it so that it would fit easily with, work, with music, yes. But there's something else that's so beautiful about this hymn, which is, the word denote, because if you look at, at, at what denotation and connotation means, connotation means something suggests something else. Denotation means it's evidence of. And Alma uses the word deliberately, denote, that you look around you and everything is evidence of God. It doesn't just suggest that God exists, it's evidence that God exists. And that's such a powerful sentiment. Melissa Dunstan. Following the events of my divorce nine years ago, my ex-husband left the church and heavily influenced our three sons who were teenagers at the time. I remember feeling I had little influence or impact in their lives, especially my two younger sons. I remember my mom telling me, all is not lost. I further found that to be true as I began a study of the scriptures, the Book of Mormon in particular, and regular heartfelt prayer to my Father in heaven. I remember reading in 3 Nephi chapter 18, verses 31 and 32, that I know my sheep and they are numbered. They are numbered to the Savior. He knew my sons. That was impactful for me. And it took time and patience, but I now have a relationship with my sons that is stronger than ever and find opportunities to regularly bear testimony of the Savior and his central role in my life. R. Kent Crookston gained a love for the natural world growing up on a wheat and dairy farm in Alberta, Canada. He earned a PhD in plant physiology from the University of Minnesota and now as a retired scientist and professor, he spends his time capturing the Earth's beauty in exquisite oil paintings. Science, I felt, felt was pitching me against the church. And I was really upset. I thought this can happen to people. And it was happening to me. And so I, and I remember Jacob saying, you know, when you get educated, uh, uh, then, then you think you're better than, than the spirit. And, and I thought, I, dang, I didn't want to have to have this struggle. Um, but I didn't know what to do because my training felt so sound. My um, training in science had given me a perspective on uh, the natural world. So I kept going and kept going and kept going and I found yet more things to support my science. And, and I finally told my wife about 10 years ago, I'm going to have to get this resolved. I mean, it had been like, you know, yeah, 40 years before I really got serious. And I just was letting it sit inside of me, a little bit of a, uh, not a heretic, but yet, you know, I really, and, and, and so I got into the text, and I had over 2,000 verses that spoke of the natural world. And they, they contained 110 different words used by 26 different contributors to the text, and they cover a 3,000-year period of history. 
and they all harmonize. And my daughter is in the FBI. She's an intelligence analyst. And when I had finished my work and I resolved this, she said, Dad, do you realize what you've done? You've got a, uh, an independent and, and a, an additional witness to the veracity of the Book of Mormon. And, uh, and so she said, you have confirmed the veracity of their testimony and, and of the book itself. So I'm liberated. I mean, my, my science and my, my testimony, my desire to, to be harmonized with, with the spirit of that book, they've come together and, and I'm stronger than I ever could have been if I hadn't done that work. That's cool. Now that you've merged them, yeah. is it easier for you to find the savior in the sciences then? It's, it's made me so much more of a believer. I mean, it's, that's, that's too weak a word. I mean, the, the Book of Mormon is absolutely a, a, an authentic record. And, um, and therefore, the, the fact that it testifies of Jesus is the reality. There, one of the, there's a verse we've been kind of talking about uh, from Alma when he t says, all things denote there is a God. Yeah. Do you find that in your work in art he, and science? Yes, yes, and all things testify of him. I mean, like you're talking about Easter. Wow, thank you so much for sharing yeah, those well, thoughts thanks with for, us. Yeah, thanks for coming out over here and visiting with me. My name is Dylan Heaton, and the Book of Mormon for me has been one of the most influential books in my life. But most importantly, it's helped me to come to know my Savior, Jesus Christ, in a deeper and more meaningful way, knowing that He has suffered for me and for my sake, um, has it enabled me to become a new creature, to become a better version of myself, and to know our Father in Heaven a little bit better. Uh, I know that He lives. I know that Jesus is our personal Savior and Redeemer. And I know that He enables us to overcome all things and to do the things that God would have us do in our lives. Dr. Paul Savage received his PhD in organic chemistry from the University of Wisconsin. At the micro level, he studies the body's innate immune functions. And on the macro level, nothing is more interesting for him than the Savior's healing power as described in the Book of Mormon. In your career, in your work, what, what are some of the things that have denoted to you that there is a God? Well. Probably the, the strongest ones, the, the strongest experiences have not necessarily been what we've discovered, but it's rather how the discoveries have been made. I can talk to you about what our fields are, the, the, you know, the complexities we of understand. what we're seeing. Yeah, I know where you're going with this, the, sure. You know, but for me, some of the, the strongest evidences that there is a God have come from very personal experiences in which I feel that I have been led, directed, that I have been inspired to pursue specific areas, specific lines of research. We, we've been very fortunate to make some discoveries and to be in some fields that uh, that have the potential to really impact human health. And I can't say that it's come because of my intelligence, even my hard work, mm -hmm. in that I really feel that I've been inspired. Is there any explanation for the resurrection of Jesus Christ or anyone else, or is it just strictly a miracle? I mean, are there sci chemical scientists who are out there who could say because of their science background is absolutely unequivocally impossible that your God came back from the dead and thus your religion is hooey, thus offending five billion people around the world or whatever, right? Uh, I mean, is there any response to oh, that from? Oh, absolutely. What do you, I mean, what could you say? What, what would a, a chemist say about a resurrection? Well, this is what a scientist says about anyone that says there's no room in the universe for God. I mean, let's take the big picture first. Right, okay. And that comes with a level of arrogance that is not justified by what we know. Bottom line. There are too many things we don't know 
and too many things that we can't know as scientists that it, it's very easy to see that there that God's hand can be through all of this and some of these things that we consider miracles fit very well into what what we can know and what may not be known. Tell me a little bit about, about how the Book of Mormon has helped you, helped your belief and testimony in the Savior Jesus Christ. Yeah, and it it's a great question. Uh, and more than any other book that has that has led me to Jesus. In Alma 7, you know, 11 through 13, and suddenly yeah. you understand that Jesus' atonement wasn't just for, for sin, sin and death. But, yeah, it, but it becomes that that as we come unto him, this is where we get the peace that he offers. This is where he, he gives us the rest that, that is necessary. Suddenly you start to understand how that how that worked, at least partially. Yeah, I love it. Well, uh, Dr. Paul Savage, just add him to the list of people who will witness that the Book of Mormon is exactly what it claims to be, which at its core is another testament of Jesus Christ. Happy Easter to you, Paul, if I may be thank so you. bold. Thank and, you. Uh, thank you for expressing your feeling and for the spirit you brought to us. This is awesome. My name is Slogan. I'm, I'm 20 years old, and I was born in Mexico. Coming uh, to the United States from Mexico was a little hard, the change of the culture. Uh, so when I was 18 years old, I, I went to serve a mission, and I love the mission. The mission changed me forever. For medical reasons, I had to come home. Um, and that was probably the hardest time of my life. I promised myself two things. Um, that I would go to the temple every single week and that I would read the scriptures, the Book of Mormon, um, every day while reading the scriptures and going to this temple. Um, the experiences I had um, gave me the spirit I needed to, to keep going through those really rough times. Dr. Tracy Hill has been a practicing MD for nearly 40 years. Now he teaches medicine to others, yet for Dr. Hill, Learning the healer's art has been a lifelong pursuit by studying the life of the Savior in the Book of Mormon. If you're going to work in an ICU, whether you're me as a physician or the nurses or the other caregivers there, then you're going to see some really tough things, right? You're going to see uh, young mothers who are life-threatened and sometimes die. You're going to see um, children have committed suicide. You're going to see horrible auto accidents. So you're going to see all those sorts of things. And having the faith to know that there is, even when the outcome's not what we hope, there is a savior and there is another life and there is hope. In what ways have the teachings of the Book of Mormon influenced your knowledge of and love for the yeah. Savior Jesus Christ? Several passages in the Book of Mormon, many actually, He's there to succor us, to lift us, to help us with our pain, our grief. And as I work in a world where there's a lot of pain and a lot of grief, it's helpful to me to have that testimony, which I have through the Book of Mormon, um, that there is a Savior, that there is a life after death. What do you say to people when they say, well, Jesus came down and, you know, they're in the throes of anxiety and angst over their loved ones or whatever, and they say, why? He went down and he just every single one of them, he healed. He healed them. What? Well, how come, why don't we have that today? Elder Bednar said once, um, do we have the faith not to be healed? And I have, uh, when I read that years ago, um, that has stuck with me through all the years. And one of the most powerful testimonies for me, that faith in the Book of Mormon, faith in the Savior Jesus Christ is observing people who have the faith sometimes not to be healed. I've seen the faith to be healed, but I've also seen unbelievable examples of faith in folks that it didn't go as we had hoped. That's awesome. Thank you so much. We appreciate your time. Thanks, and if you don't mind, uh, I noticed over here you have an examination area. I do have what I think is a torn meniscus. Oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, if you could just maybe. Yeah. Hello, I am Connor. 
Um, I am totally blind, born with it, um, and never get to see in my whole life. Um, the Book of Mormon is the book of hope. Uh, from Book of Mormon, I know the Savior better from the, those stories, those prophet Nephi and uh, Alma and those people, their experience. And from all those words of Christ, I really know that Jesus Christ really loves us love me. I think for me, Savior looks like a really powerful and but warm. I can feel He is, um, He loves everyone. I can feel the love of Him. He wants everybody to come to Him. Dr. Ross Barron received his PhD from USC in religion and social ethics and provides some interesting insights on how the Book of Mormon points us toward Christ. I was raised not as a Latter-day Saint. I was raised as a Jew and oh, okay. went to Hebrew school. I was bar mitzvahed when I was 13. But the thing was is that uh, when I read the New Testament as a senior in high school, I read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and on my own. I just decided I need to do this. And I went to my high school library, I read that, and I'm gonna use Latter-day Saints speak right now. I felt the spirit. Yeah. Now, I didn't know what was happening when I was 17 and a half, right. but I was feeling something. Right. And I left feeling like, this is true. But then I had a friend, it's a long story, but I had a friend and he gave me a copy of the Book of Mormon. And um, I actually went and knocked on their door and said, how do I join your church? And it was, and it was really reading the Book of Mormon. There was a, a moment in the Book of Mormon where, I mean, it was that transcendent moment and didn't see an angel, didn't have a vision, but that same spirit that rested upon me when I was reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John rested upon Revisited me again. You. Yeah. And then I knew, and it was so powerful. So as overall, as a witness of Christ, um, just returning to our original theme here, why is the Book of Mormon so important to the world? Okay, so in terms of clarity, so if somebody said to me, I want to learn about the atonement of Jesus Christ, like I want to understand the atonement right. of Jesus Christ. Look, again, would I have them read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John? I would. But if you want to go to 2 Nephi 2, 2 Nephi 9, Alma 34, Mosiah chapter 3, Alma chapter Wait, 3, 3 Nephi these... 11, 3 Nephi 17, <laughs> you're gonna learn theologically things about what Jesus did that you really can't learn anywhere else. Now, where's the verse that talks about Jesus taking upon him that he may know how to succor them yeah. in their infirmities? Yeah, yes, right? oh, absolutely. Where it's not just sin and death, but it's also all the other things that we mentioned earlier. And yes. That, and that is Alma, that's what I thought, okay. I mean, so in Alma chapter seven, so he says this, starting in verse 11. Well, actually he starts in verse 10 because I think it's fascinating. He says, and behold, he, Christ, shall be born of Mary at Jerusalem, which is the land of our forefathers, she being a virgin, a precious and chosen vessel. So we've got to always establish that from Mary, he's going to be able to die and that from his father, he's going to be able to overcome death, right? We got to establish that. So it's interesting that we always get that context. Mary's his mom, God, the father's his dad. He can die. He can overcome death, right? Yes. I can't. Yeah. He can. Okay. Then he gets into this. He shall go forth suffering pains and afflictions and temptations of every kind. So we got pain, sicknesses, and, and temptations. We've got death. We've got infirmities. And then finally he says, verse 13, Now the Spirit knoweth all things. Nevertheless, the Son of God suffereth according to the flesh, that he might take upon him the sins of his people, that he might blot out their transgressions according to the power of his de deliverance. And then he ends, This is the testimony which is in me. Oh, my word. So in three verses, 11, 12, and 13, what the Book of Mormon did is testify of what the Bible testifies about what Jesus did, but then expands it a little more to make yeah. it more encompassing. I love that. That, I think, is what makes it another testament, Correct. another testator, another witness of Jesus Christ. Right. You have just been, and probably still will be, <laughs> once we're done with you, uh, just a wonderful visit and interviewee, and thank you Pleasure. so much for your insight and your great spirit. Happy to be here.
Hi, I'm Yangzi. I came from an atheist background. I didn't know God for the longest time until my last grandpa passed away. I asked my dad, what is the purpose of life if death is the end? So my dad didn't have answer to those questions. And I asked my dad, why do I need to study so hard then? Like, why do I need to be a good person, a moral person? Everything doesn't make sense anymore. Later, I was a foreign exchange student when I was 15 years old. I got to stay with an LDS family. And it was really through that family example and all the members of the church's example, I felt like it's possible there is a God. It's possible I am a daughter of God and that I started embracing um, the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. And it really changed my life and it brought so much happiness in my life. And I no longer fear death and I no longer fear making mistakes because I know that the moment I choose to turn myself to Jesus Christ, I know that He will help me, that death is not the end because of Jesus Christ, because He lives, we can all live with Him forever. Um, so it completely changed my life and how I approach everything. For 17-year-old Emily Traveler, what started as a carefree double date turned into a life-altering accident when the ATV she was riding in crashed and rolled. With the prognosis of profound paralysis, Emily has come to understand God's love for her, His tender mercies, and the infinite depths of the Savior's atonement. About two years ago, I was a sophomore in high school when it all happened, okay. and I went on like a double date nice. to the sand dunes, and we were just like razoring, like an ATV type thing. When we were going, we were just kind of messing around, and it ended up rolling four times down a hill. Wait a minute now, so were you driving? So no, I was in the, like a back seat. So I didn't have my seatbelt on. And so we all rolled. And then I ended up like hitting my head on the ceiling, which made me break my neck. So then I was just laying there and I like, obviously woke up to not being able to feel my body or move my body. We got to the hospital and saw her transfer to the trauma bed and saw she had no function of her limbs. And that settles in that it's like for a minute, it's not okay. I just felt like this sense of comfort of like, all right, well now I've seen my family. So, you know, like I kind of got to say goodbye just because I just felt so close to the Lord and thinking I wasn't going to make it. Jesus not only carried out the atonement for sin and for death, but also yeah. to, to take upon him our infirmities, our sicknesses, all manner of afflictions. What do, what do those verses mean to you? I think like they're big for me because I, like sometimes I just felt like so alone, not like anybody has ever gone through this, like just nobody knows my pain, yeah. knowing that somebody also was in my shoes, you know, and like took the pain for me. Yeah. It's like comforting. That is, yeah. oh, that's very well said. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So there's still days where, you know, you think, why did this happen? Right. This is really hard, but I know he's with us. And so it's a foundation of peace and hope, so. Because it really is, while she's taking the brunt of the physical damage and yeah. the loss of possibilities, <laughs> perhaps, yeah. that are now just kind of converting into other possibilities. But the immediate reaction is, now this is over, now I can't do this, now I can't mm -hmm. do that. She's not the only one. Correct. Who now has to alter their life plans, right? So does having faith in the Savior also help bring that concern into focus for you and your husband as a couple? your plans, those kinds of things, or do you just, are you just rolling with it a day at a time? I mean, how does that? Um, I mean, yeah, we try and stay in the day like Emily, but you do have to make a choice to have faith and to trust him because it's so overwhelming and you want to fix it so bad when your child's hurt. And you just have to remember that he's watching over her. So I almost have to step back and take more of a passive role and for me, that's not easy as her mom. Right. But it's the only way I can get through it because I can't fix it. We, we 
started reading the Book of Mormon this year, and I read it through different eyes now, which is interesting. But just even reading through the beginning and all the trials and tribulation that that family went through, and yet how Nephi continued to turn back to God, but it wasn't easy for him. You know, and I think people see Emily now, and she's beautiful, and she radiates, and she's progressing, but it's still really hard. And so I resonate with Nephi. Yeah. That till the end, he was, you know, trying to do the best that he could for his family and his people. And so I yearn to learn from the people from that book because I see it through different eyes. And I feel like our Savior is so loving in the Book of Mormon. I just... I feel his love when I read that book. So, is the Book of Mormon truly evidence that Jesus Christ lives and that he carried out this amazing atoning sacrifice that we celebrate right now, this, this resurrection unto eternal life? Ultimately, that's for you to decide. My suggestion would be that you grab a copy and you prayerfully read it with a sincere heart. I have done that, and as we've heard over the last few minutes, the testimonies of these guests that we've had on this episode have also borne their fruit. That the Savior, sure, we find him in the Bible. We love that as a witness, but to have another witness, another testament of Jesus Christ, only strengthens our faith. Well, that's it for this episode. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope to see you next time on A Marvelous Work.